League has been getting progressively worse since 2000. Let's be honest, 2015, I think. For a couple months, top lane has been a discussion point for a lot of players, and for potentially a pretty good reason. It feels like some of the most historic and fun top lane champions have no longer become viable and no longer have a place in the current meta. Whatever happened to bruisers and fun carry DPS top laners picking things like mages and you remember back in the day like Morgana and Ken and top, why is it just a tank versus a tank every single game? Well, is it? I mean statistically and historically speaking, was top lane a better role back in the day? Or are people just viewing it and seeing it through nostalgia goggles? Well, I spent the last two weeks researching top lane as best as I could, going back through old forum posts, old reddit posts, watching VODs, going through old professional games, checking the statistics, going back all the way to 2010. And that is the exact question we are going to answer today. Over the years, top lane has become less and less about 1v1, and more and more about the enemy jungle pressure, dodging ganks, poking, farming, and just going even in lane. You hardly get a chance to play anything but tanks, right? Surely, the top lane meta is far less balanced and less fun than ever before, right? This is the history of top lane. In the beginning, for all lanes included, strategies were primitive compared to today. One thing that must be established right away at the very beginning of this video is that player skill and understanding over time will be much better. As with anything, whether you want to talk about speedruns, League of Legends, traditional sports, or technology, over time, people will improve. Think of it like this. In speedrunning, the popularity of the culture has gone up a lot, and the exposure that some of the speedrunners now get on their Twitch streams, YouTube videos, and events like AGDQ and SGDQ, the incentive to prove and the time that runners are putting into games these days has gone up massively over the last decade, causing the times of legendary game speedruns go much lower than what was ever imagined to be possible. This idea is no different to League of Legends or other online games. Despite any changes that Riot will put in, over a period of time, players will just get better and develop better strategies. They will also have a high level of increasing game knowledge and understanding season to season, and in the very first parts of League's history, this is no exception. Top lane at the time was a role that generally had a few options, but it had less to do with the lane itself and more to do with your opponent and you. Players would often switch around what lanes they went purely based on matchups and the champions that they've picked. And because at the time there wasn't always a jungler, many times you would see 2-1-2 strategies with no jungler involved. Eventually though, some players would stand out above the rest. Arguably, somebody who stood out the most was Hotshot GG in his Nidalee top. Oh my god, these creeps too. GG, son. If you watch through Hotshot's old VODs and streams, you can see even at the very beginning of League, he was a really good player and he was very mechanically sound. He had strategies and counters for each lane and he would constantly talk about his builds and what you can do to win this specific lane that he was in. I wasn't around during this time, but I can only imagine just how impressive it must have been to watch him play live. And for a while, this is kinda how top lane was. You either pick something pretty tanky, somebody who could poke such as Teemo or Nidalee, or you played AP carries such as Morgana or Annie top lane. It was a relatively diverse role if you consider that it was mostly AP or ranged champions. In fact, according to a forum post by Pistallion, the Season 1 World Championship had a lot of the NA teams coming with the strategy that most teams had at the time doing an AD carry mid lane and an AP mage top lane. But in the background, slowly kind of creeping up without many people noticing, was the sustain meta. 
Let's start with the Yorick patch in June of 2011. He is released as a champion many people didn't know where he was supposed to go. But then, because of his sustain, people started taking him top lane. This champion was incredibly frustrating to play against, and his sustain was basically unmatched. He could duel you no problem, and he constantly was able to push the wave, and as soon as you got a couple mana items, you basically were unkillable in a 1v1. Then, if you consider Skarner, a champion designed for the jungle, who had sustain, he was also a part of this big sustain meta. Then, we saw the release of Riven. Riven overall was a pretty good example of a champion that Riot released who desperately tried to fit in the meta. Riven definitely seemed to be a solo laner and had a bruiser type ability set, but she really didn't have a lot of sustain in her kit. So exactly what you might consider, Riot gave her a bunch of health regen per second and per level. At the time, Riven had the single highest health regen of any champion by a large amount. Her base health regen was 12, and eventually after a few patches it was nerfed to 10, which is still a lot of health regen. You can even find older videos of Dyrus and Stonewall making jungle Riven work very well. As long as you bought a little bit of sustain, the ganks were good, your health regen was good, and you could clear pretty well. Eventually, this meant that the meta of sustain was almost impossible to deal with, and the pros picked up on this in other lanes. You saw Soraka, Sona, and Janna be incredibly popular in the Season 1 World Championship, and back when Dyrus played on Epic Gamer, you saw him playing a lot of Singed. Basically, you pick things that healed their way to victory, and even though we wouldn't see Bruisers become incredibly popular yet, we can still see their very early beginnings. This time frame is important to our story, because at the time, Riot needed to give melee champions sustain. This meta was heavily revolved around range versus melee, and if you were not able to sustain your way through the laning phase due to often playing against mage top laners, you were essentially thought to be worthless. In the end, two European teams would go on to play in the Grand Finals for the Season 1 World Championship, with Fnatic winning it all. And for the time, it seemed like there were essentially two top lane options. And just when a lot of people started to think that the AP top lane versus sustain meta was the set in stone meta for top lane, Season 2 happened. A very long time ago, on October 19th of 2010, we saw a buff slash change to Warmogs on version 1.0.0.103. It was given some buffs to its base stats, as well as some nice quality of life by lowering the combined cost, but the most important thing is that the passive was changed and reworked slightly. At the time, Warmog's passive was changed to give permanent 4.5 HP and 0.15 health regen per 5 seconds per minion kill. Champion kills and assists grant 45 health and 1.5 health regen per 5 seconds. Bonuses cap at 450 health and plus 15 health regen per 5. And this was massive. This meant that stacking this item up gave you a ton of HP. And eventually, once we finally got towards Season 2, we saw the rise of a new build, the Atmogs. Atmogs is a combined term between Atma's Impaler and Warmog's Armor, two items that were very strong at the time. Warmog still exists in the game, but Atma's is no longer available. Atma's Impaler at the time was an item that gave you 45 armor and 18% critical strike chance, as well as a passive making it that you gained attack damage equal to 1.5% of your maximum health. This meant that the combo of building an Atma's Impaler, which was a relatively cheap item always costing anywhere between 2300 and 2600 gold, as well as building a Warmogs, gave you armor, HP, critical strike chance, and attack damage. This ended up meaning that a lot of champions were very tanky and very hard to kill, while also dealing a lot of damage and having crit chance. 
It was the meta golem of top lane. Every top laner had the chance to become a bruiser simply by building Atma's Impaler and Warmog's. It was the core of what made bruisers good. Both items were very strong and synergized a massive amount due to the damage and tankiness that you would get. If you also combine this with a Trinity Force, these champions would become nearly unkillable. Frozen Mallet could also be built so it could have a place along with Warmogs, making you incredibly sticky on your opponents. And it also so happened that champions that Riot released that year, such as Darius and Jace, fit into this meta very well. Jace was hard to gank and traded in lane extremely well, and for the time, Darius' ultimate was unmatched. It was easily one of the most powerful ultimates in the game. Sustain was dead, and champions like Udyr top lane completely fell off the map and out of top lane, and champions like Jax, Olaf, Darius, Jace, and Aurelia had a great time dueling other champions. The meta and the mentality had completely changed. Instead of worrying about having sustain so you could trade blow for blow, back and forth, back and forth, top laners had to worry about flat out dying, being 100 to 0 and sustain at this point just wasn't going to cut it. At the time, the Asian teams dominated the Season 2 World Championship and had relatively similar tactics. It wasn't a complete, utter meta shift, but it is worth mentioning that teams implemented strategies of dealing with the AD carry and support going top to force a 2v1 against the enemy top laner. Playing poke champions and playing lanes of sustain and attrition just did not work anymore. You would easily be tower dive in 2v1 or 3v1 situations, so you had to be able to defend for yourself. When you speak about trends in history, it's a little bit hard to tell exactly when they started because usually these are things that ramp up over time. But exactly six years ago, on Valentine's Today, February 14th of 2012, CivHD, one of the biggest content creators for League of all time, released a video showing his new Atmog's Twisted Fate, and this video has amassed over 900,000 views to date. This trend, however, could have possibly been picked up even before this. Roast Pork posted on the forums in October of 2011, saying Atmogs has been built in every game. He mentioned some of the champions he was seeing with this, such as Shaco, Gangplank, Aurelia, Garen, Jarvan, Scion, any AD champion with this build is just so strong and it's game breaking. But really, aside from a small conversion reduction on Atma's Impaler, this was left relatively untouched by Riot. And once we reach the end of Season 2, the World Championships would show the true power of these bruisers. Jace, Irelia, Olaf, Yorick, and Jax were some of the most popular top lane picks for the pros, and Moscow 5's Darien even whipped out a Zinzao top lane pick. Top laners wanted to duel, take ignite, and beat each other to death until somebody came out on top. And even though Shen was and still is a tank to this day, his builds at the time did consist of a lot of attack speed items. Bruisers, a few tanks, and a few AP carries were the go-to selection for top lane players. With a few champions sitting at the top of the charts receiving nerfs, it appeared like top lane was one of the most dynamic roles in the game, having three different styles being good, and you really had to know how to play against a few different champions. But regardless, the role was thought to be in a pretty okay spot, relatively balanced with a few exceptions here and there like the Atmogs, but it was pretty cool. Surely the meta wouldn't make any drastic changes. I mean, Riot wouldn't implement an item that would make bruisers way overpowered. Surely there wouldn't be some cheesy strategy that would come up for the early game to make some champions have to get gutted in the process to keep balance for season three. I mean, come on, that wouldn't happen, right? <laughs> Considered by many players to be the single biggest mistake in Riot's balancing history, the Season 3 Black Cleaver is the most overpowered item to ever exist. When this was released, this item gave you 250 health, 50 attack damage, 10% cooldown reduction, 15 flat armor penetration, which was the old version of lethality, and its passive that gave you armor shred all stacked. All of the stats on this item stacked, including the passive. What this meant is that if you built several of these, you could eventually be dealing true damage to your opponent while still getting attack damage, while still getting HP and cooldown reduction. With four of them, you dealt true damage, you had a thousand HP, 
200 AD and 40% CDR. According to several different sources, champions who could abuse this such as Talon, Riven, Pantheon, and Misfortune had their win rates jump by over 10%. If this is not the biggest overlook by Riot, I don't know what is, and this was the term of League of Black Cleavers. Eventually, it was fixed, and it made it so the passive was no longer stackable and the item was nerfed, but it did show that this item really did pave the way for bruisers to become good once again in Season 3, and even AD assassins to become god tier. For the Season 2 World Championship, Rengar and Kha'Zix, some of the newest champions in the game at the time, were globally disabled. But as soon as Season 3 rolled around, not only because they had a very flexible build path because of Brutalizer, but also this item was just very good in its own right. Champions such as Kha'Zix could be played in the jungle, but also very effectively as a mid and top lane assassin. For Season 3 as well, we saw the rise of Talon and Zed being viable mid lane assassins, and a few of them could even go top. Zed had a few decent top lane matchups. And eventually, one of the first adopters of Renekton as a very viable top laner with Black Cleaver was TSM's Dyrus in the early parts of the Season 3 LCS. And for a while, this is pretty much what you saw. Lane Kha'Zix being relatively dominant, champions like Renekton, Mundo, and Shen still being as good as ever, and Jax just creeping up in there as a relatively popular pick. But Kha'Zix and Riven and Renekton and Talon and Jace didn't always have to go Black Cleaver first item, and there was one other item that they were using that made them very, very powerful, and up until its removal in patch 4.2 is probably one of the most unbalanced and unfun to play against metas and items to ever exist. But of course, as a Riven player, it was great. Bring it back, Riot. Please, good, good work, good work. Nice, nice, nice. Good job. If you were playing an early game champion and you started this item, it was an absolute nightmare for your opponent. Elixir of Fortitude was a starting item that only cost 250 gold before its eventual nerf to 350 gold, and it gave your champion health AD, and so much dueling power that no other starting item, no matter what, whether you start Longsword, Cloth Armor, Doran's Blade, could even remotely compete with. Not only was it just that good, but you got more potions, and it gave you an instant burst of health, not only being able to surprise your opponent, but allowing you to escape and survive ganks. This item alone made it nearly impossible to lane versus early game champions because the threat of dying level 1, level 2, level 3 was just so incredibly high. Any champion who could use this well basically made it impossible for you to play the game. And from the early to middle season of season 3, all the way until the middle of season 4, so for about a year worth of time on the timeline, we basically saw this massive early game dominance of these amazing champions such as Riven, Kha'Zix, Renekton, Jace, Talon, Zed, who just absolutely murdered you in the early game, and in solo lanes, assassins were awesome. But eventually, Riven got nerfed, Zed got nerfed, Renekton got nerfed, Talon's silence was removed, and we started to see the nerf of the red elixir, and then eventually on patch 4.2, it was completely removed from the game. So the question then becomes, what now? How do we go from these early game champions, such as Riven, Kha'Zix, Renekton, taking Ignite every game, Jax taking Ignite, just murdering you over and over in the early game, assassin meta, quick games, to these very long, very drawn out, incredibly slow games for top lane, where it's just a tank versus a tank in competitive play, there's almost no action. How do we go from there to now in just a couple of years? How did the meta drastically change in this way? As I just said, there were direct nerfs to these champions, but that wouldn't completely 100% change the meta. It wouldn't go from bruisers to tanks. But there would be one change that would impact the top lane meta for a very long time, and that is the buff to teleport. If I had to pinpoint one of the most important points of all of top lane's history while making this video, 
it would be patch 4.4 when teleport received a buff. Teleporting to an allied turret now refunds 100 seconds of the cooldown and the channel duration reduced from 4 seconds to 3.5 seconds. And just like that, within the span of a few patches, the Fortitude Elixir was removed and Teleport was buffed, meaning we saw a drastic shift in the meta from Ignite to Teleport. For a very long time in League's history, Teleport went relatively unchanged. It was used, but it wasn't really used by the champions nowadays. It wasn't the go-to summoner spell for top lane. Really, only champions such as maybe Singed, or Rise, or Nasus, somebody who wanted to scale, or split push, realistically used Teleport. Most of the time, if you were Riven, or Renekton, or Trundle, or Shyvana, somebody with dueling power, or some kind of bruiser or tank, you still took Ignite. After this buff, however, we saw the Rivens, and the Renektons, and the Irelias of the world start taking Teleport, and once we arrived at the Season 4 World Championships, we saw a very heavy Teleport meta for top lane. There was hardly any Ignites. And this was a turning point. This was a massive turning point for top lane. And if you don't believe me, if you actually look and you go through at the selection of champions over the years for top lane, and we actually pinpoint season four, you will see this massive influx of champions like Lulu and Rise and Rumble top lane. You mostly saw these ranged AP champions come back because they couldn't be punished by these bruisers anymore. Let's go through from Season 3 to Season 7 in competitive play and let's look at the presence, so the picks and the bans for top lane champions all throughout the seasons and let's just see how drastic it is. For Season 3 top lane, we had three classic bruisers be picked in the top 7. Renekton, Jax, and Shyvana, and even at the time Shen was picked a lot, but he was also more of a bruiser than a tank back then. For Season 4 at the very beginning, we did have these bruisers be good, but that was because at the beginning, we had Ignite Champions. After the teleport buff, Renekton, Shyvana, and Mundo basically became the triad of top laners, and they were picked a ton. We also saw the rise of Lulu top. And once we entered Season 5, this is where things started to make a turning point. The most picked top lane champions then became Maokai, Gnar, Hecarim, who was a bruiser but built very tanky, Shen, Bruiser slash AD Fizz, Lulu, and Rumble. We started to see a focus away from these bruisers. And once we got to Season 6, this arguably became the worst meta for top lane bruisers. Poppy, Tank Echo if you remember at the time with Grasp of the Undying and Iceborne Gauntlet, Gnar, Trundle, who is a tank, or he's a bruiser, but he beats tanks because he steals the resistances, Maokai, Shen, and then the only real carry champion top lane was Gangplank because historically he does very well into tanks. And finally, Season 7 rolled around, and this is when Fervor of Battle was good, mind you. This is when champions like Renekton and Jarvan on our list could take Fervor of Battle and do well versus tanks, even though they were basically tanks themselves. They built very tanky. But once again, we really didn't see a shift away from the tank meta. Shen, Maokai, Nautilus, Gragas, and then we had Rumble, Renekton, and Jarvan. So, what does this mean? Does this just mean the entire class of bruisers is completely dead and they're unusable? There's no way bruisers are ever going to come back to competitive play? Well, not really. I don't think so. One of the important things to get out of the way and to note, because it's kind of the elephant in the room, in solo queue, bruisers are still good, and they were basically good throughout this entire process as well. I would say from my time playing, Season 6 was the single worst season for bruisers and carries. The combination of Iceborne Gauntlet and Grasp of the Undying was so prevalent that basically carry and bruiser AD champions top lane were not viable whatsoever. And in Season 7, I thought bruisers were great in solo queue. Champions like Fiora and Riven and Renekton with Fervor of Battle were very good. But the underlying issue with top lane, at least for competitive play, doesn't really have a lot to do with the bruisers, but it has a lot to do with the game itself. I think that ranged champions are just too good, and we've seen this and we've seen this complaint for top laners for a while, and basically you can see through history this was a problem. As stated in the very beginning of this video, at one point in League's history back in way early Season 1 and pre-Season 1, range versus melee was an issue. But with 80 carries and supports and mid laners having so much range, so much CC, a lot of peeling, it just makes it harder for bruisers to have a true impact on the game at the very highest level. 
And through my research, that's kind of what I've noticed. Throughout times of bruisers being dominant and being the best class in the game, it was either through two means. One, the bruisers were always tanky if they were good. When bruisers were strong, it was because of things like atmogs. They weren't full damage, full assassin bruisers. They were definitely tanky, but they dealt damage. If you even think about the Black Cleaver meta, obviously that made champions like Riven and Talon and Renekton very good, but in part, they were tanky because they got health from the Black Cleaver. In no time through League's history were bruisers really that good because they were full damage, full assassin. It was because they really were tanky on top of dealing damage. But I think now that exact role has become what tanks can do. Tanks deal damage, but are more tanky and have more AoE and control. And lastly, the other reason that bruisers were good before was because of the fact that they were impossible to 1v1 for top lane. With Ignite and the Elixir of Fortitude, it made them so good because tanks really couldn't get out of lane. It didn't really matter in Season 3 and Season 4 that Maokai was god tier late game just like he is now, the problem was getting there. In these early game early pressure junglers were really popular as well. Back in Season 3 and Season 4, Elise and Lee Sin were amazing junglers. Which meant that if you tried to play a tank top lane, you were just gonna get dove by Renekton, Elise, or Lee Sin Riven. There was no way to get out of lane as a tank. But I don't think the balance of saying that tanks are widely OP is necessarily true, I just think their counters aren't strong enough at countering them. Much in the same way that I think right now, there aren't a lot of counters for mid lane. With the issues of mana and mana flow ban and games taking a really long time to get going, the issue is just that things that would beat Azir historically, like Zed, just aren't true anymore. Zed gets smashed by Azir. But that's just my opinion, and that's based on my research. Let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you like and subscribe. And this has been the History of Top Lane. Thanks for watching.